You are listening to Revenge of the Drive-In. I am your host, Patrick, and I'm joined by a repeat guest... Sean. Sean, how are you doing? We've had you on here a number of times. Yeah, I believe this is my third time? Third or fourth. You're a Godzilla guy. I, I, yeah, I, to I guess I'd even right. say I'm a Godzilla expert. Yeah, maybe. maybe. <laughs> I didn't want to claim that for you, no. but... Well... Did you go to G-Fest this year? No, I didn't. I've been to G-Fest twice. I almost went this year. Okay. Although I am attending a virtual academic conference later this year called Godzilla at 70, which is a, okay. about the 70th anniversary of Godzilla. Sure. Which probably won't have vendors or anything like G-Fest, but should still be a good time. <laughs> no costume. No, uh, and there's no, no costume contest. parade, no. All right, well, that is, of course, one of our films is going to be a Godzilla film, but our double feature today is the 1951 science fiction classic The Thing from Another World and the 1965 film Invasion of Astro Monster, a film that, as you point out, has many titles. Yeah, I grew up having a bootleg VHS copy of it called Godzilla vs. Monster Zero. Mm -hmm. But I think there's even that's, more That's, more that's probably that. the best title. Godzilla vs. Monster Zero? Yeah. I, I mean, think so, because the movie, like, Invasion of Astro... Well, first of all, it's weird. I just found out today it's not Invasion of the Astro Monster. It's just Invasion of Astro Monster. He's never referred to as Astro Monster. The original Japanese title is Kaiju Daisenso, which is the Great Monster War. So it literally... Which could be the title of any Godzilla yeah, movie, yes. basically. That's basically all monsters attack, is basically that. Yeah, and a lot of the Gamera films also have those very vague titles, at least in the North American releases. They mm -hmm. they never really seem to care too much about staying true to the, the Japanese title or dialogue, obviously. Well, speaking of vague titles... Does it get any more vague than The Thing? No. The Thing from... I mean, yes, this does have the longer title, but if you if you were to re just refer to this film as The Thing, I include the From Another World just to kind of, if nothing else, distinguish it from the John Carpenter remake. But if you look at, like, the poster, the poster emphasizes The Thing. I think it was always called The Thing just as much as it was called The Thing from Another World. Yeah, I think so. I think actually, actually, I recently just read a book called Selling Science Fiction by J.P. Talat, and it's mainly about how the genre of science fiction kind of came to exist in the 1950s in the U.S. Like, there had been, you know, the pulps and stuff before that, but as a, a cinema, it kind of happened in the 1950s, and the point of the book is that nobody really knew at the time what science fiction was yet. They didn't know how to deal with it. So there's a whole chapter on actually how The Thing and The Thing's marketing campaign purposely didn't want to define itself, and they kind of did that with the title, too, which I think is really interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because this, the thing from another world definitely has one foot in the, like, classic Universal Monsters camp. Mm, definitely, yeah. I kind of appreciate that about this movie. And even though I love 50 sci-fi, obviously, there's the, the this film kind of is split between just traditional classic monster movie and then the... the, the timely 50s sci-fi stuff but yeah i think you can actually see that really clearly too in the fact that i mean the the monster in this film obviously i think he kind of looks and resembles you know universal's frankenstein oh for sure for sure and what's interesting is all three thing movies you know this one the 1982 one and then the 2011 prequel oh, yes <laughs> they're all based on a short story called who goes there and what's interesting is the, the John Carpenter one's the one that actually does the best job of being faithful to the, the story for the monster. So I think it was like a, right. it was like a conscious choice in 1951 to make the monster less like the short story and more like, you know, a universal classic monster, like you were saying. Sure, that makes sense. It wasn't just an accident, I don't think. They, mm -hmm. they did it, you know, consciously. Yeah, so interestingly enough, this film is produced by Howard Hawks. And as you talk about kind of the developing of science fiction as a genre, 1951 was a big year for that mm. because you also have The Day of the Earth Stood Still and I think Two Worlds Collide or The Worlds Collide, whatever that movie's called. And it's weird because sci-fi would quickly become a B-movie genre in the 1950s, mm -hmm. even though there were always, like, high-quality A-movie pictures, The Day of the Earth Stood Still, this to a certain extent. 
Yeah. But it is yeah. weird that Howard Hawks is a producer. And even weirder still, many people claim he directed this film, although he is not the credited director that is Christian Nyby. But Howard Hawks is about as classic old Hollywood as it gets. Red River, one of the greatest Western films ever made, starring John Wayne, that came out a few years before this. He perfected the like screwball romantic comedy with films like His Girl Friday with Cary Grant and he's just like a classic Hollywood figure it's weird to see him dabbling in B-movies and it's like it's one thing if he's just a producer but if he did indeed direct it as many claim right that's even weirder yeah that's true yeah there's a lot of unknowns and ambiguities surrounding this film and the making of it and and all sorts of things about the actual you know, history of the film. And yeah, that's definitely an interesting one. Yeah, now I've never read that much into if Howard Hawks directed this, if there are like good arguments for it. I think part of me just... I hear this, and I think maybe it's it's this happened a bit with uh, Spielberg and uh, Spielberg versus Toby Hooper with Poltergeist. I mean, that movie was truly directed by Toby Hooper, but it was claimed at the time that that Spielberg was basically the uncredited director. And many people now view that as like just a slight against genre filmmakers that like, oh, it's a great movie. It couldn't have been directed by this Toby Hooper guy. This has mm. got Spielberg's stamp all over it. And I wonder if that's a, a bit what's going on here. I really know nothing about Christian Nyby, but I wonder if it's just like, hey, there's this huge name attached to it. Like he probably directed it. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Or at least he was maybe kind of a, a supervising director or something like that, where, you know, maybe he wasn't handling all the day-to-day things, but had, like, some... A heavily you know, involved yeah, producer. Yeah, definitely, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm looking at what else Nyby had also worked on. Yeah, so he worked... He edited some of Howard Hawks' other films, so okay. they clearly knew each other pretty well. Mm-hmm. He worked on Red River. Red River is referenced in this film. A character hums the theme song from it. I oh, that's interesting. That. Because I was uh, the thing I've always heard about, like, hey, this is probably a Howard Hawks movie. It's like it it contains all of his his trademark like characters talking over each other, really fast dialogue, and it does. But does that have to be Howard Hawks? And you know, if it's not Howard Hawks, wouldn't it make sense that it's someone who worked closely alongside him all those years? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, the person would already be very familiar with, you know, his techniques, his style. Yeah, you'd think so. Editor more so than other uh, occupations on Mm -hmm. on a film set, I would think. But yeah. Anyways, I did enjoy that there is a shout out to a Howard Hawks film in the the character humming. But all of this is to say, of course, that The Thing from Another World, 1951, opens up with a journalist, Ned Scott going to an officer's club in Anchorage, Alaska. So this is interesting because if you've seen the John Carpenter movie, it's Antarctica. Mm -hmm. The story's Antarctica. Here, you wonder why the movie chose the Arctic Circle. Otherwise, maybe the reason I would think would be to, like, get some Russian propaganda out of it, but they get very little of that. I think maybe they were trying to include, like, this, you know, cloud of the Cold War hanging over it. But yeah, you're right. They don't really use it for too much. And they could have, you know, done the same thing with Antarctica, too. Probably it was just easier. And maybe Alaska was kind of a a cool location, you know, it had only become a, a state. Okay, yeah, I see. What, two two years something. earlier, I think it was nineteen forty nine. No, no, yeah, no sorry, it's so. nineteen sixty. It's not a state. Oh, it's yet. later. Okay. Yeah, both Hawaii and Alaska, I think, are fifty nine or sixty. Okay. So yeah, so it would have been in U.S. territory, you know, kind of exotic and interesting. <laughs> Probably in the news a lot because of you know the Soviets and yeah, you know everything. So we're dealing with President Truman, I guess, at this point. And I, I don't think do they ever mention, I mean, not that they would mention him by name. There's a lot of, like, we need to hear from the higher ups. I don't yeah, think they ever yeah. go as high as the president, though. No, I don't think that. Do they, they might mention LeMay by name because he would have been the, you know, Curtis LeMay was the general who formed SAC, the Strategic Air Command. And I know. Okay, I a, do I do think they mention him by name now. Yeah, I didn't so, know who that was. But yeah, he, he was like, well known from World War II and then for founding SAC. And, you know, he was pretty involved in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And then in, in 1968, he actually ran for president. He was vice or sorry, he was George Wallace's running nope. mate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. So, oh, how the mighty have fallen. Yeah, yeah. So 
Yeah, but anyway, yeah, the, I think they do mention LeMay by name, which I thought was interesting, because normally mentioning an actual specific general by name in, in an American movie is usually, you know, very uncommon, I guess you could well, say. Well, when you're dealing with a fictional story, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, you have yeah, plenty of, like, yes. this is the era where they were making a ton of World War II movies, too. So, I mean, you mm-hmm. know, MacArthur and Patton and those guys are right, name right. dropping like crazy. But Yeah, but adding a, a character like that, like a, a true-to-life character into a, a fiction film, especially, like you said, a borderline B-movie science fiction film, is just... It's yeah, I, 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 I don't think this is a true B-movie, but I think the modern audience would view it as such. Oh, definitely. And and I am, of course, the number one defender of 1950s science fiction, and I'll get more into that later, because I find it very frustrating that, that people tend to think of these as B-movies, um, mm-hmm. e- even though some of them are, are great. Is yeah, this well, one of them? You'll have to wait and find out to see what <laughs> we have to say. But anyway, so initially, we're I guess we follow Ned Scott, Scotty, but we don't really have a main character for a while, and, and it's... Captain Pat Hendry gets called in by his superior. I don't remember if this is a general or whatever, but apparently there has been some kind of scientific investigation at the North Pole that's come across something very interesting. The wreckage of an odd plane, I think is what they say, even though when we get there, that's not really what they believe. So Pat Hendry is ordered to go up to the North Pole and in what seems like a very not American military thing to do. They bring along this journalist. Yeah. <laughs> who, who's, who's intent is good. I mean, it, they get very like, no, 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 you can't print that later. But like right off the bat, this is like, I don't know about this. And it's kind of interesting. Ned Scott, he could easily be our main character, but he kind of becomes a side character. And then you're just left wondering like, what, what was he doing to begin with? He was just going around Alaska looking for a story. He had no reason to be up there. Was he, <laughs> he just vacation there and... I don't know. Yeah, it's true. I didn't really think about that particular subplot, but... Well, he becomes a subplot, so you don't really think about it, I guess. Maybe. Right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thing. It's a little bit of sleight of hand. It's interesting. Some of the things they do with character in the classical period of Hollywood into the 50s, and so they don't look right to, I think, modern viewers, because... And I think just... that makes them interesting in many yeah, cases. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Like, you don't really know where this is going. I mean, you you know broadly what's going because it's a monster movie. You've probably seen The Thing. But, like, th- there's still just, like, little surprises along the way. And so it's when they arrive at the North Pole at that research station or whatever that we meet, I wouldn't say the main character, but I was surprised to see the highest billed actor in the film, Margaret Sheridan, playing Nikki. Captain Pat Hendry's romantic fling is like ex girlfriend. It's it's a little vague. Yeah, it's vague in that nineteen fifties sort of way where they they don't oh, yeah. want to yeah, have exactly. anything scandalous going on. <laughs> no, you're you're right. I wasn't I wasn't actually thinking of it from that perspective, but you're right. Yeah, it's like an I love Lucy can't say pregnant has to have two beds in the bedroom. Oh well, the, yeah, they, they kept up with the two beds like into the seventies, I think. But yeah, it is surprising that she's the main character. She honestly doesn't have that much to do, and honestly, her relationship with Pat Hendry isn't really a big part of the movie. It, it, it kind of seems like it will, and then the end of the movie acts like it always was, and it really isn't. Yeah, it's true. Like, it's, it's another one of those odd little subplots that comes and goes in this one. And it's interesting because the John Carpenter thing doesn't even have a female character, so it's like we're getting rid of all That's of true. that. That's true. Yeah, gone back in time 30 years, moving forward 30 years. Yeah, it's true. It still definitely does not pass the Bechtel test, but the fact that they do have a female character, and like you said, she receives top billing, and she's fairly important for a while. I think, if I remember correctly, she even makes one or two very important discoveries throughout the course of the movie, or puts pieces together. She also kind of accidentally comes up with with what the way that ultimately leads to them defeating the thing yeah that's true yeah but anyways um so what is this thing it's this well it's this thing it's encased in ice dr carrington who's a kind of a weird character says it's like it had all the appearances of a meteor but it changed direction like we know it was piloted Mm -hmm. and they get there there's a nice shot of them kind of measuring it out they see it's a you know it's in, buried beneath the ice but they see that it's like a perfect circle mm-hmm. so they know it's it's definitely a really cool eerie scene mm-hmm. it actually... i like i like this stuff more than the equivalent in the john carpenter's thing i mean i'm not i would never say this is a better yeah that's true that. i actually have a bit of a 
a thing with my memory, but I always got the scene of them, you know, slowly spreading out in a circle on the ice to kind of outline the aircraft, and then they form a circle, and, you know, that's the big reveal, you know, that it's you know, a flying saucer, not mm -hmm. a normal aircraft. I always remembered that as being in the Carpenter film, but it's not. It's in this one. Yeah, no, and they just have I a map When I think about it, basically. I think of just what a cool scene it is, and then automatically my brain mm -hmm. goes, oh, it's in the Carpenter one, but no. Yeah, because that's the better movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I really love the excitement of the characters when they realize it's a flying saucer. They're They're apprehensive, but they're also like... This is the most yeah, historic yeah. thing ever, they're and not, it feels very not, genuine. They're not too scared. Yeah, they really are like, wow, <laughs> this is awesome. So it's, it's like we didn't already have decades of alien attack movies to, to lead us into this. Where <laughs> yes, it's like yeah, this they're, still, be... they're optimistic about the possibilities. <laughs> they, ha they decide to blow up the ice to get into it, and they actually end up ruining the ship. But thrown clear of the ship is a body encased in ice they say it must be eight feet tall and they they bring it back to the research facility where it's basically slowly thawing but they but they're like kind of awaiting further orders like what do we do with this and until then Hendry just says like okay we'll be on we'll switch off on our watches and stuff yeah and then a blizzard you know blows in right uh that's right why. yes yeah, that's an important point, because, like, all the versions of this story, they always have to get cut off from the outside. Gotta world, be isolated. Right? So, yeah, yeah it's, so, it's, so it's... the blizzard blows in and cuts their radio contact, so they don't have orders from above. But they also do have radio contact, it's just very slow. I guess are those telegrams? What is that? Because they still oh, get Oh, maybe, yeah, them. I don't know. Well, I know the Navy uses something called, like, ULF, ultra-low frequency, where they can they can get through pretty much anything, but it takes, like, 60 seconds to get a letter because it's using such a long wavelength mm -hmm. that it, you know, could go through things like blizzards or the ocean. But uh, so maybe yeah. that existed back then. I think maybe it's possible, you know, radio technology, at least in 1951, was pretty good. So maybe that's mm -hmm. the kind of information they're getting. But yeah, yeah it's not really clear. Definitely could be. They're getting some very be. slow info. It's, it's just slow enough to, like, change the stakes at these, at these like, opportune moments. It's, yes, it's, yeah. it's very convenient levels of communication for the storytelling. But it's this jackass who's humming the Red River theme that ends up putting... Because th there's a lot of talk about like how ugly and disgusting the monster is. We still, still don't really see it too well. But he decides to cover it with a blanket so he doesn't have to look at it. Except, of course, he uses the electric blanket. So, so it thaws extra fast. <laughs> and then there's a scene that kind of reminds me of the, uh, the original Boris Karloff mummy. When the monster comes out and doesn't kill him. In The Mummy, he just leaves him in shock as he walks away. This is uh, a little different because the, the guy, the dumbass, takes out a <laughs> pistol and shoots it, claims he hits it, but it just kind of goes away and then goes to attack the dogs basically outside. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I, one of the earliest uh, memories I have of my childhood is actually like watching in a marathon of old sci-fi movies on mm -hmm. you know a Saturday someday. And I remember that whenever what was on before this movie ended... When they did like the commercials in between, the announcer said this was going to be a movie about a giant killer vegetable from outer space, mm. and that I mean, it's you true. know it convinced me to keep sitting there and to watch the next movie. And that was the very first time I saw this film. But I think it's an interesting, you know, kind of over the top 1950s description of the character, mm -hmm. obviously. But you know, it, it is. It's a lot. It sounds a lot sillier than it is. In yeah, the yeah, definitely. But yeah, so then the, from here on out i mean they do see the monster killing some dogs outside which are some pretty neat shots the monster of course the thing is played by james arness who i'm sure was cast for a size he's a big guy he, like i i think i read at some point john wayne didn't want to act beside him because he made him look small and john <laughs> wayne was john wayne always looked huge on screen yeah, yeah. but yeah james arness eventually became quite famous like a few years later appearing in the show gunsmoke oh yeah he was uh he was six foot seven Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, he, he makes Chuck Connors look small. Mm -hmm. Speaking of TV Western stars. They eventually kind of just go around. They, they, at first they think, oh, the, you know, the, the dogs rip off the monster's arm. It can't possibly live out there. And so they take the arm back. And this is when they discover that the arm is still alive, thus indicating that the monster is still alive. But also, like, it resembles plant more than it resembles animal. Yeah, hence the killer vegetable from outer killer space. vegetable yeah and this sounds dumb except the explanation is like if you just hear that in a vacuum it sounds dumb 
Right. But the explanation is actually kind of neat. It's like, well, what if vegetable life evolved on this planet the way animal life did here? Mm-hmm. Like, sold. I'm, I'm completely on board with that idea. I completely accept that. And they also discovered that it appears to have, like, absorbed or consumed the dog's blood. So it appears... You say killer vegetable, it's also a killer vampire, basically. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> And then we get a lot of scenes of just kind of characters looking around, looking for clues, and we get this intercut with Dr. Carrington, who, you know, classic movie trope, no, we can't kill it, we have to study it guy, Right. ends up being very shady because he discovers that the thing had been in the greenhouse, but he keeps this information from the military because he's convinced they're going to kill it. And, like, yeah, they are. It's interesting, Carrington... The motivations are not bad, and yet this is never a character that I I can't imagine someone being frustrated by, though, too. <laughs> it just seems so cheesy. Yeah. I mean, especially, like, he's also part of, like, the 1950s movie trend of always having a, a doctor character be British for some reason. And he kind of looks like a mad scientist. They give him, like, weird hair dye or something. He yeah, looks like Yeah, his, his hair is too blonde. <laughs> yeah. Think. Yeah, they're doing something with him. He's they're trying to make him into a mad scientist and Yeah. Well, I just looked up he's doesn't. played by Robert Cornwaith, which this is interesting because the doctor definitely has like an upper class British accent, at least somewhat in the the movie. I think it comes and goes. Yeah, I didn't feel it was very consistent. Yeah, but, but Robert Cornwaith, the actor who played him was from Oregon. He was an American actor from Oregon. Okay, and so that he definitely sense. has like jet black hair in his pictures. Okay. <laughs> on yeah he's weird Wikipedia. looking in this movie so they clearly like bleached his hair or something yeah and and to me i don't know if that was just like an like a choice of oh, the this is what the character looks like but to me it makes him look like they're trying to make him look a 1930s mad scientist he's got a bit of a, a malfoy look to him if you are a harry oh. potter fan elderly malfoy okay yeah, yeah. or Lu- just lucius malfoy yeah maybe. yeah without the long but he's got like a kind of a perm right would you say like uh yeah I think yeah, so. Like kind of short, though. Yeah, short, kind of curly hair. And it's clearly been bleached. Maybe he's just wearing a wig. Could be. It's hard to tell in the picture quality of some of these early 1950s films. So, since she's not part of the military, she's part of whatever scientific community is there, Nikki kind of gets pulled into Carrington's deceit. But she also betrays him the first chance she gets because she shares the notes with her kind of ex-boyfriend guy. They figure out what's going on, but there's there are also several scientists that are killed at this point that we don't ever really get to see. We see like an injured guy waddle his way out of the greenhouse, and that's pretty much it. Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty tame, obviously compared to the the John Carpenter one in terms of oh goodness, you know, goriness, <laughs> uh, bloodshed, anything like that. I mean, although yeah. you do actually see some blood uh, on a few occasions, which is more than some 1950s films mm-hmm, do. For sure. So. Yeah, and, and I like when we actually see the monster attack. It feels brutal. Like, uh, the size, the combination of size and just the right amount of flimsiness of the sets when we just see, like, pieces of wood kind of <laughs> yes. fly around when he yeah. slams his arms and they shut the door on his arm. I, that stuff, to me, was very effective and, and felt, like, modern enough, like, you know, better than you would see in most 50s movies. But, yeah, it, it's basically, like... Goes from monster attack to, like, we learn a little bit more about the monster slash might get a little bit of communication from the general who says, keep it in, as intact as possible, do not harm it. But Pat is, Pat doesn't care. He's like, we'll blow it up, we'll kill it, whatever we have to do. Uh, I'll I'll take the court martial. I'm okay with that. <laughs> this monster is, is, at this point, it's killed three or four dogs, two or three scientists. Eventually, it's Nikki that says, like, well, it's set up a lot dumber than this, but I'll say she kind of suggests that they burn it. Mm-hmm. And I think she says something like, well, what do you do with a vegetable? You could boil it. And and it's like, are they trying to make her just talk about cooking? Because that's her. Oh, like, it felt, yeah, yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't really thinking that, but it's like, it is weird that her first. <laughs> is boiling a vegetable? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a little little 1950s, a, a little bit, but they burn it. And this scene's awesome where they set it on fire. The entire room is on fire. There's a neat shot where it swipes towards Nikki, who's told to hold a pillow in front of her. And as it swipes, it rips open the pillow and the pillow is on fire. Yeah. Really awesome stuff. Amazing fire stunts, especially yeah. for the time. 
So they learned that the fire kind of worked, but also didn't work. So the next time, because they don't have flamethrowers and stuff, and they're telling the general to bring flamethrowers, you know, a thing movie without flamethrowers? My goodness, how, <laughs> how, how, can they, how can they survive? But they decide to electrocute it. And that short, black-haired guy it rolls like some kind of electrical wire, and they have to get the monster to walk on these wooden planks and be like directly in the center of them, like when he crosses certain things and they can electrocute him. The The build-up to it is, is pretty long and pretty suspenseful because you, it's, it's just, I think the suspense is really well done, but like also the stakes are changing because it's getting colder and colder because the monster has broken their furnace or whatever and as carrington keeps saying the monster's way smarter than we are and i guess he's not arguing to study it i mean he is but his big thing is we need to communicate with it yeah it's kind of one of those quests for more knowledge deals that sometimes drive scientists mad yeah i feel like that's all over the godzilla movies oh yeah yeah definitely i think it's it's probably in hundreds of movies if we (laughs) <laughs> list them for sure. <laughs> for sure and again reasonably well done version of that character not the best far from the worst especially for the time no I, well i think what's interesting he's not over the top you know he's, he's right he's not a mad scientist he that's kind of what believable. i mean i guess yeah and it, it goes a little over the top maybe in this scene when the monster is walking slowly and then the scientist he shuts off what little power they have, holds a gun at them, but then he's disarmed, but then he just ends up running out to the monster trying to talk to it. And you got to think in a modern movie that he just gets ripped in half. Here they kind of just push him away, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this this is a wonderful death in any kind of modern movie. Um, oh, yeah. And kind of, it, it's a chance to kind of have some fun with it. It's the ultimate payoff to a character that was a little frustrating and not entirely believable. But yeah, they just kind of shove him aside, and actually, they determine that he he'll survive. Like they could have still killed him. At least they didn't even do that. Yeah, just you know, not make a big deal of his death. Like he gets swatted into a wall, but you know, maybe it's a much more powerful swat than we we think. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So uh, at first, the monster is not on the planks, and then a the guy throws like a pickaxe, slides a pickaxe towards him, which forces him onto the planks. But even still, they have to wait for him to be, like, in a certain spot, a certain distance from them. Then they electrocute him. Some neat optical effects for the time with this giant James Ernest man just kind of hula hooping around as he's mm-hmm. electrocuted with three beams. And then it's 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 a, it's a happy ending. It's, it's that classic, oh, we're going to get married now. They don't go, it's not quite that bad, but it's basically all these men are encouraging their captain to marry. And then the journalist, who I've largely left out but there are constant moments of him arguing with the yeah, captain he, he like about ducks how... his head in every now and then <laughs> yeah he, there's always some kind of thing with him being frustrated about how this story is going to get scooped i'm not going to be able to write it and uh but he finally gets to bro- radio broadcast his message so it's it's a it's a happy ending for him for sure and it's a happy ending for the scientist i guess maybe I, they killed the thing and they diminished it where it's a pile of dirt but um he lives at least he could have easily died but then still we get that classic 50s sci-fi warning this this is the classic this is in those this is in godzilla films mm-hmm but it's it's he says, no matter who you are, wherever you are, you keep watching the skies. Yeah, like watch out for these things to happen again because there is a lot of. I like this whole. I like this entire speech, this radio broadcast, because it's very positive. But it's acknowledging of the stakes. It's like we just won the first ever battle against alien life. There will be many yeah. more to yeah, come. There will, there will be more. This is not over. Yeah. This movie doesn't feel as big stakes as The Thing. The Thing makes it pretty clear how, you know, sorry, the John Carpenter film, that that thing makes it very clear how easily it could destroy the world when uh, mm-hmm. Wolf of Brimley, I think, is playing around on the computer or whatever. Yes. This movie never f- quite feels like a world-ending threat, but this last speech is really like, oh, yeah, okay, this is good. Like, it, it, it puts it in a bigger sphere i guess and this is like it's it's a little sensationalist Mm -hmm. for this character he does say he does lead off by saying thousands of years ago noah saved the world with with his ark or whatever yeah (laughs) but i like it i like it it's 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 dated 
but it's <laughs> fun. Yeah, it is. It is. Which is how I would describe this movie overall, I think. Mm. So, Sean, what do you think of The Thing from Another World? I do like The Thing from Another World. I'd probably say it might be my second favorite sci-fi film of the 1950s, maybe. It was probably mine for a long period of yeah. time, or at least for a few years. Yeah, the only one I think I would... What's your, your, your Forbidden Planet guy? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I kind of thought so. What's your top... Oh my goodness! I am I am the the day the earth is still is like a ah, top okay. twenty okay. film of all time for me. I love that movie. I think Forbidden Planet's very good too. There's several other really good ones. Yeah, there are. But yeah, yeah, I like it. Um, I think it's interesting the way it's not exactly like the John Carpenter one of the short story. Which is good because this movie is so clearly overshadowed by a vastly superior version of it. Mm -hmm. But it's good that they're different enough where it doesn't feel like, oh, I'm just watching a worse version of another movie. Like, it's right, its, its right. own thing. Yeah, it is. It, it has, is. Yeah. And like I said, it's got the uh, several great scenes in it. It's got the... The, the fire really stunt good is awesome. fire yeah. stunt. It's got the really good finding of the UFO out on the ice and mm -hmm. forming a circle. Mm -hmm. It's got the great monologue at the end, the mm -hmm. radio broadcast. I think those yeah. are probably my three favorite things about the movie. Yeah, so I'd definitely recommend it to someone who likes kind of classic film and hasn't seen it, or just mm -hmm. likes sci-fi generally. If it's a Howard Hawks film, it, it's it, it's not one of his better ones. This isn't Red River. This isn't His Girl Friday. This isn't Rio Bravo. But this is good. And again, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not really sure it is a Howard Hawks film, truly. But I like this quite a bit. I would slide this into the B tier of 50s science fiction films. Yeah. S tier... Definitely. Being the day the earth is still and the day the earth is still alone, unless we include the original Godzilla, uh, then it's a two film thing. Fair. Eight A tier. I would put Forbidden Planet in there. I would put War of the Worlds. I would put The Incredible Shrinking Man, and maybe one or two other. But I think this, the thing from another world, tier B, about on par with Creature from the Black Lagoon, with The Fly, with the Quater Mass Experiment. Oh, maybe the blob. The blob might be mm, a the blob. Lower. Yeah, yeah. But I, th I think this is in good company with those other movies. It's, it's, it, it doesn't have the themes of some of the better ones. The day there's still Forbidden Planet, and right? All Forbidden no, Planet is is Shakespeare in space, basically. You know? <laughs> and but it's it's just it's a very fun movie. I think the monster stuff is well done for what it is. You yeah. know, it's it's certainly dated. By mm -hmm. today's standards yeah i think the characters well overall the, I, I didn't think the characters were very well defined i did like all of the just interactions among them it's that howard hawks like high energy kind of funny stuff mm -hmm. this is like a funnier movie than you would probably guess oh definitely it's i mean it's got that little bit of yeah a little strangers on a train yeah, ish yeah, but... like that you wouldn't expect it to be a comedy and it's kind of a comedy at times but yeah the film knows when to get rid of that mm -hmm. the film knows when to be serious but in the early stages especially like the characters having some fun but also expressing a little apprehension over their discovery the discovery of the spaceship like some of those exchanges are a lot of fun but once there's a monster we don't mess around with no, that a whole film, lot except for get serious at that point except yeah. for nikki's revelation hey let's boil it or whatever <laughs> then then it's a little goofy <laughs> But yeah, good movie. Not quite a great one. Yeah. And let's talk about Invasion of Astro Monster. Is that what we're calling it? Whatever we're calling it. I'm going to call it Monster Z Zero. I'll try to go with Astro Monster, but I just know it's so long as Monster Zero. That and that's fair. Just, just and I'll point out, use. too, I watched this on Max, which it's like the Criterion Collection version, the Janus Films one, whatever. Mm-hmm. Because they have all the... What's the first period of Godzilla movies? What's that called? The Showa period. Yeah, okay. It has all yeah. of the Showa era on Max. I don't think it has the others, except for the, the new Monsterverse ones. Yeah, I think you're right. Well, that would make sense. The Criterion ones only went mm -hmm. up to the... Yeah, no Biolanti yeah. in the Criterion, no, unfortunately. No. Yeah. But each time I've watched one of those, you know, prior to this on the podcast, that's how I've watched most of them. It's it's always just started as subtitles, or that's always been the only option, I think. Even. Mm -hmm. This one, I was surprised, starts with the dub, and I wonder if maybe it's because I looked up a specific title. Oh, If, if possibly, I looked up yeah. Astro Monster, and that takes me to the dub one, I wonder if there's a subtitled one under a different title on there. 
Yeah, that's interesting. It's interesting, too, that a lot of these Toho Godzilla films have multiple dubbings that were done by different studios for different releases over the year. Yeah, so whatever the first original release was that was called Monster Zero, and whatever the first one that was Astro Monster, they probably have two different voice tracks for English dubbing. I don't have both, so I can't double check on that. But There, were, there were some funny moments do. in this one. Nothing hilarious. Nothing, oh, Godzilla, what terror language. <laughs> but there was some good stuff. Yeah. No, no complaining about corns, like in That's King true. Kong versus Godzilla. <laughs> that was from um, King Kong. King Kong yeah, versus yeah, Godzilla yeah. is when they're on um, Skull Island. Yes. There's, you know, sometimes the dubbings. You know, all the ones I had when I was a kid obviously were English dubbed, and sometimes you know, some of those lines just stick in your head and you remember them mm -hmm. many years later, and you lose that. I think in terms of just a fun movie watching experience, I know every most people prefer you know watching films in their original language with subtitles i think is the preferred mm -hmm. proper quote-unquote way to do it. i think that's but, the proper way but yeah. i've i'm an advocate for just whatever is going to make you enjoy the movie more yeah yeah that's what i mean dubbing if there's a little bit of ironic comedy to it, it i think it it, <laughs> it fits in a schlocky monster movie about guys in rubber costumes i i don't want to watch like yeah. a, a real serious movie no, with this kind of cheese it's it's fun but it gives it a very different movie going experience it's almost like you can watch the two totally different movies if you watch the the japanese original and the the english mm -hmm. dub and it's fun in that way too yeah just depends what you're watching it for so yeah, I had this one from when I was a kid, and one of the things that struck me rewatching it that I always just remembered that I thought was strange was the opening credits for this movie take place at some world space agency, I forget what the actual name of it is, but it just cuts from, you know, building to building to rocket to whatever, and then there's just this UFO sitting there. <laughs> and, you know, clearly they were just taking... <laughs> you know, photos of different, you know, sets or miniatures that they had built. And one of them was the UFO. But it doesn't make any sense that the UFO is sitting there at the beginning of the <laughs> film because we haven't met the characters yet. Which, that just always kind of struck me as odd. And, and re-watching it now, when I'm much older and hopefully wiser, I still don't understand why they, they did that. It buys them, <laughs> like, two seconds of additional footage. And it just, it's an odd choice. So we're we're getting introduced to this World Space Agency, which is where the movie starts, and we find out that our two heroes, Takarada Akira's character and Nick Adams' character, who are named Fuji and Glenn, or... Glenn. Yeah, John Glenn. Yeah, I, I yeah definitely a reference to John Glenn, played by Nick Adams, so I think we should talk about a little bit more later. I, I was reading a bit about him. He was the original clout chaser. Yes. I don't know which... James Dean movies he made with with him, but he was in I think at least I think he was in Giant maybe he's in at least one John or James Dean movie and he was allegedly close friends with James Dean. I have a feeling he wasn't as close with him as or you know James Dean <laughs> probably didn't feel as strongly about him. But alleged uh, romantic affair. I think it's fairly well known at this point that James Dean was probably bisexual. What would be a, what would take a bit more convincing and be a bit more controversial is if Elvis Presley was bisexual because a few years later, the colonel basically paid this guy to hang out with Elvis. Mm -hmm. And they allegedly became very close. But again, also to a way that makes it sound like he he just annoyed everyone around him but Elvis, <laughs> apparently. Elvis apparently did enjoy his company, but everyone else hated him. <laughs> it sounds like Nick Adams was a was a miserable person to be around but yeah he, yeah, he, 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 he had, he had his connections yeah he did um so i'm just looking like me he was a native pennsylvanian and yeah he went to japan to do a few movies he was in the rebel on abc which is probably his most famous role he was he, i believe he's an academy award nominee i didn't read that last night but i think i've read that before okay for a best supporting actor for mm. something you know he was he fit into this kind of category of American stars that went to Japan in the 60s, 70s and 80s, almost all of which were blonde-haired, blue-eyed. Okay, so Japan is like recruiting those guys basically. Yeah, it be, it became like the Japanese view of what an American looked like in mm -hmm. that era and a lot of the Americans that were going over there either were blonde-haired, blue-eyed or I actually saw an interview once with an actor who dyed his hair blonde. And then, as soon as they became available, got blue contact lenses, mm. which it made him look really weird. But to 
<laughs> like the scientist and the yeah, from another world. Exactly. Yeah, but to uh, you know the Japanese audience, he looked like the stereotypical American at the time, and I think that's why Nick Adams was in Japan making some movies. Yeah, it's in- interesting. I I knew nothing of the industry of american actors going over to japan i know a little bit about the american actors going over to europe whether they're clint eastwood who is not really significant or lee van cleef or whether they're kind of washed up stars right but yeah this this was a new phenomenon for me this is an american japanese co-production and i find it weird that it was that that it received american money and wasn't released in the u.s until like 1970 or something like that yeah yeah that's unusual toho usually just made their own films and then marketed them abroad later if they felt like it which wasn't very consistent i know most of the later ones were um like maybe right after this one were released by american international pictures aip which is a big uh company of 70s 80s it was a big company, though, for a while, and they specialized in, you know, acquiring foreign films, maybe dubbing them, maybe editing them for an American audience, and then releasing them. Oh, they only went out of business four years ago. Where were we? Oh, talking about Nick Adams. Yeah, and then uh, we'll come back to him later, because he has a sad ending to his story. Yeah, so we got Glenn, played by Nick Adams, and Fuji, played by Akira Takarada, who was a Godzilla series regular. He was in most of the Showa-era films as, you know, different characters. They are both astronauts, and they are traveling to this newfound planet, even though the planet seems to actually be a moon of Jupiter. They call it Planet X, and it's been hidden from humans throughout our history because it uh, orbits right behind Jupiter, so you can't really see that it's there from Earth. Fuji and Glenn are heading to Planet X, We've made some real strides in space technology. It's kind of funny. This movie takes place, or yeah, it's, yeah, I knew you were it's filmed in 1965, <laughs> but in the beginning, in an on screen text scene, they tell us it's the year 1960X, which, I mean, it can well, only, it be only be been four, four years, years, years later. At I most. Mean, at most. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the fact that two astronauts can travel. It's the year from we Earth... landed on the moon, to be fair. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's I, I, true. I don't know if people really saw that coming in 65. No, but yeah, but now we're off to Jupiter in a two man spacecraft that can get there within like a couple of days. Yeah, seems. I wasn't even thinking of that. Yeah. Yeah, and then they go, and they their their mission is to land on Planet X, even though we apparently know nothing at all about it. So it must have been just a really a brand new planet. Yeah, a really <laughs> high priority. Circled a few times. No, let's just land there. Yeah. Yeah. So they land. And it's any moon set. Oh yeah, seen. definitely, you know, definitely. It's, it's just a gray, a gray, nothing gray detailed moonscape. about this uh, planet's no. world. But they do say it supposedly has an atmosphere. I think they say it's ten percent Earth, but somehow they're breathing just fine. Um, again, some Hollywood or Toho magic in this case. But there's a good eerie scene when they land there where Fuji wanders off to plant the flag, which interestingly has a UN flag, a Japanese flag, and a US flag on a, a staff together in that order. And then Glenn disappears. He doesn't pop back up on the radio when Fuji contacts him. And then Fuji just starts, you know, wandering around. The music gets pretty eerie. I forget exactly how it sounds, but it's kind of a creepy scene. And then eventually this ominous voice basically just comes out of the ether and says to him that Glenn is with them and he should go down this kind of cool elevator that pops up out of the the earth to take him down. And then there's a cool scene where he goes through various kind of lit corridors. It has a bit of a spy thriller feel mm-hmm. to it, I think. And then, yeah, he meets the aliens of Planet X, who I think are called Zillions. Yeah, some, something like that. For it's sure. the letter X, as in Planet X, and then Illions. So Zillions or Exillions, <laughs> however you want to say it, it's awkward. One zillion dollars. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so he meets them, and Led by they, the controller. Yeah, the controller. And they are kind of this dystopian, what's the word I want to use, androgynous kind of... Uh, <laughs> yeah species they have like little antennas coming out of the suits they all wear matching suits obviously they have these kind of Jordy laforge things yeah I was covering say their Jordy eyes. they felt uh, in general this this predates star trek but it felt very star trek like yeah this movie in general is very heavy into the 60s sci-fi more so than any other godzilla film many of them are really just monster movies yes yeah this one is definitely as much sci-fi as it is monster which I like, especially as an accompaniment to our last film. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. So yeah, then the, the controller basically says, 
Oh, and we, you know, we get Nick back. He's fine. <laughs> or Glenn, sorry. I like Nick how, Adams, how you shrug that off. Yeah, so he's back. <laughs> he's, he's not dead. He's really not that interesting with character. No, right? he's so not. It's just like, yeah, he's fine. Yeah, yeah. He's kind of like... He's bad in this movie, by the way, as an actor. He's the only one I feel comfortable fully judging because it's him dubbing and him acting, I assume. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he's awful. Yeah. I th- I thought he was terrible. Yeah, I mean, maybe I've not seen his other work except for the other Toho film he's in. War of the Gargantuas, is it? It's either War of the Gargantuas or the first one, Frankenstein Conquers the World. I think it's the first one. I think maybe Russ Tamblin's the only okay, American in okay. War of the Gargantuas, which is an amazing film, by the way. Which I actually think this is the same year as that one, so he probably was just doing I both think you're of them right, for yeah. Toho at the same time. Mm-hmm. Okay. And yeah, he's not he's not great. I I've, I've not seen him in anything else, so maybe the reason mm-hmm. his career took this turn is because he just, you know, wasn't the best. <laughs> if he didn't have his uh if there's any famous, famous people to hate out there, I yeah. apologize, but if he wasn't around uh, all these famous people to prop him up, maybe he he really didn't have it. He's definitely not carrying the movie on his shoulders. Yeah, so the controller tells them basically that he and his people have a terrible problem and people of earth know what that problem is because it's our our old friend king Ghidorah, <laughs> who had come into existence the prior year in Ghidorah, the three-headed monster yeah yes and yeah, he's exactly. monster zero and there's a line where it's like oh why monster zero and it's like we number everything here and it sounds like he's going to explain why they do that but he doesn't <laughs> he doesn't no 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 <laughs> it's monster zero yeah and, and, yeah and okay what's one what's two <laughs> yeah well that's the other funny thing is that godzilla and rodan we then find out are monsters zero one and zero two yeah they're not one, one and two, and two. yeah so they, they, really he should they be were preserving zero, their digits zero, they didn't you would yeah say. yeah king adora is the problem of all these zillions living on planet x and then just on time, as if on cue, we cut to a screen that the controller is showing them of King Ghidorah attacking mm-hmm. the subterranean zone. Seems a little city. too good to be true, but yeah, you think it's yeah. kind of just a cheesy movie thing. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so King Ghidorah basically flies overhead. How he flies around when he weighs so much and the planet has such little atmosphere, I don't know. It didn't bug me when I was a kid, but yesterday <laughs> when I rewatched this, it, it certainly made me wonder. Uh, this is the most strings I've seen in any Oh, movie. yeah, yeah. I the haven't strings, seen this many strings, strings in the early Godzilla in films, one. yeah. I never saw them when I was a kid because I think you don't see that kind of stuff when you're a child. And because VHS yeah, tapes probably. were much more forgiving to Godzilla For sure. films than these new remasters. High-definition streaming, yeah. yeah. There's, you can't hide anything, which I'm sure when they were making the film, they never even thought would be a possibility. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't something they were worried about. Yeah, so he flies overhead, you know, shooting his lightning bolt electric beams at the ground, which is causing all sorts of cave-ins for the zillions. And then suddenly a, what do they call it, hydrogen dioxide station is hit, which is just a fancy word for water. I think I've got it wrong. But then the zillions kind of, you know, lose their shit put up a bubble around Glenn and Fuji in what's a pretty good special effect, I think, Mm -hmm. and turn off the lights and rush away. And then this causes Fuji and Glenn to talk about how they think there must be a severe water shortage on Planet X, which I think most people would guess, considering the surface was a barren, desolate wasteland. Yeah, but but, but I guess this confirms that they need water to live if nothing else. yeah i might not yeah. have thought that before so the zillions then basically make this plea to glenn and fuji that they really need to borrow godzilla and rodan because they had defeated king Ghidorah in the prior movie with the help of mothra though that's true which is a completely yeah. ignored but that doesn't come up in this one we just need two other monsters so we get godzilla <laughs> and rodan and Fuji and Glenn say, all right, we will take your case back to Earth and we'll be in touch. Oh, and yes, the Zillions promise the cure to cancer if they're allowed to borrow. The dub, my dub said the cure to all disease. They did not oh, specify okay, cancer. Oh, okay, okay. I, I have to confess, I watched about half of this one in Japanese with subtitles, and then I switched to the English dub, so... Perfectly fine. I just yeah. like pointing out little... D- small interesting differences like, yeah yeah i know it is and, and also you know if we had watched two different versions if i had my old monster zero cassette i kind of remember it being cancered in that one too so i think again it's an issue of even which english dub we have 
Yeah, so they do that to sweeten the pot, right? So then Fuji and Glenn head back to Earth immediately. It was a really short trip all the way out to Jupiter. Uh, mm -hmm. We still, still haven't done it yet in 2024, but they did it with no problem in 1960X. <laughs> They're back on Earth, and then we have a really fun scene where there's basically a... <laughs> A global conference yeah. to very, decide. Very, uh, very to serve man. Yes, yeah. And they have to decide whether they're willing to loan Godzilla and Rodan to the Zillions uh, in exchange for the panacea. I don't know, it just feels very cheesy. It doesn't feel like, like well, I guess there's no way that we can imagine the world uniting to discuss No, I mean, like it this. happens in a lot of Godzilla films. I mean, even at the, it does. this film the, the earlier... The Godzilla films are, are maybe more optimistic yeah, than... Yeah. Because we have films. we have the World Space Agency and it's a UN spacecraft that is going to Planet X at the very beginning. So so yeah, we have this global conference and again I think they have the UN flag hanging up and then they want to hear from all interested parties <laughs> about what they think about this trade and we hear including from, yeah we hear from the medical delegate and then we hear from the housewives delegate, <laughs> which is just <laughs> it's it's a really bizarre choice. Who, ch who chairs that committee? Uh, Saudi Arabia? I don't know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, both both the medical delegate and the housewives delegate And those are like the favor. only ones we hear from. It's, yeah, just, they're it's the like they're equivalent of the team. And then the chairman something. basically says, without any opposition, we, we agree to this, and the people of Earth then decide to loan out <laughs> Godzilla and Rodan in exchange for the cure for disease. Yeah, very, very quick negotiations. Yeah. The Zillions already know where Godzilla and Rodan are sleeping. One is a lake. I don't remember the name of the lake, and the other one is a mountain. Godzilla is sleeping at the bottom of the lake. Rodan's in the mountain. And just as soon as they agree to the deal, a Zillion spacecraft rises up out of the... Uh, sorry, three rise up out of the lake. They had been there the whole time, just waiting for Earth to approve the deal. So this, this gives them a bit of a sinister aspect, too, I think. I think we're starting to kind of question their motives. And there's a more personal sinister aspect, too, because Nick Adams is dating one that turns out to be an alien or, or whatever. Yes. And there's that guy that makes the invention. Yeah, there's a whole it. subplot I haven't mentioned yet. With yeah. yeah, it involves Fuji's sister, who's dating an inventor named Tetsuo, who basically he he makes this small rape alarm called the Lady Guard. <laughs> is that what it was supposed to be? I, I guess, think so. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I think you're right. Which is basically it looks like a little makeup case, but if you press a button on it, it releases this horrible sound. So there's this this whole subplot of this, which does turn out to be important later. Very, yeah. But yeah, the, the company that the inventor tries to sell the Lady Guard to is a woman played by actress uh, Kumi Mizuno, who's a pretty famous Toho actress. She, we had seen her earlier on Planet X, and now she appears as a human working for this company. So then again, we're starting to get some questions building about who the Zillions really are and what their game is. Uh, yeah, so Glenn starts dating her miss namikawa glenn's dialogue towards women very weird oh yeah yeah it's not a huge part of the movie but <laughs> he, he sounds like someone who's never interacted with a woman before. yeah yeah it's very unnatural again part of the reason why i say he's really bad maybe it's the dialogue is terrible mm, yeah yeah but he doesn't you know a, a really good actor can lift up even horrible dialogue well yeah think of how how many awful sean connery lines in the james mm. in the early james bond movies about true. women yeah and he kind of makes them work he does yeah even if we acknowledge they're dated horribly like <laughs> i love the one in goldfinger when he's talking to felix Leiter and there's that bimbo and he's like man talk and he just spanks her on the ass yes, like he yes. kind of makes that work he does you know yeah especially in the time period it, it works and makes exactly sense. um and it doesn't seem hokey but yeah here we, we they don't actually lift it up out of that <laughs> it's pretty hokey and yeah, yeah it's Nick more Adams... on par i would say with like king kong that was something that when we covered that for the podcast i was amazed at how awful the male romantic lead was mm -hmm. and how awful his dialogue was like how yeah. poorly dated yeah definitely Sorry, so yeah, so the Zillions already know where Godzilla and Rodan are, so they immediately kind of shoot these electrical rays out of the bottom of their spaceship, 
which is a very conventional looking flying saucer, I would say. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so they, they pull up Godzilla out of the lake with like this electric beam. They blast a hole in the mountain where Rodan is sleeping and pull Rodan out with the electric beam. And then the third ship lands, we meet the controller again, and they invite... Do Fuji and Glenn both go? Yes. Yeah, they invite Fuji and Glenn to return to Planet X with them on their uh, flying saucer, and then they all take off together, and we find out that they're going at an incredible speed, and we also find out that the computer basically makes all their decisions for them. Mm -hmm. Very kind of classic anti-technology background plot of the mid-60s. So yeah, we land on Planet X, and Godzilla and Rodan kind of engage in a brief battle with King Ghidorah, Leaving with it with us one of the most memorable moments in film history upon the conclusion. Oh, which one do you mean? <laughs> the Godzilla dance. Oh, oh yes, that's true. Yes. I mean, come on. One of the one of the great schlocky Godzilla because Godzilla up to this point hasn't been too schlocky. Like Godzilla the character. I think King Kong versus Godzilla is No, no, we definitely yeah, we definitely haven't gotten but that's to all the Kong. chatting with uh Anguirus in Megalon yet. Yeah, the yeah we get we get they they swear a bit. Uh, he swears at Rodan or whatever in the mm -hmm. last one. Mm -hmm. But this is the Godzilla dance. This is setting us up for that the tail drag against is that Hetera. The Hetera he flies backwards. That's right. Yeah, yeah, he does the long tail drag. I think that's the one with Jet Jaguar, whichever one that one is. Oh, that's Megalon, yeah. Okay, yeah, There's it, it gets goofier and goofier, and it, it, it this Godzilla dance is a significant one. Yeah, I think I kind of if, blocked it out a little bit. <laughs> if you're not on board with it, I totally get it, but if you are on board with it, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, it kind of takes you out of the uh, <laughs> the immersiveness of the story world. Yeah, because so far the storytelling's been pretty good, pretty, like, again, 60s sci-fi, little Star Trek, proto-Star Trek, mm -hmm. and then we just get this <laughs> big rubber costume jumping around dancing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so then the we get this reveal, basically, where the zillions turn... I'm, I'm trying to think of the best way to say this. I, I mean, obviously, the whole time we've been kind of hinting at this, but it turns out the zillions didn't really you know, have the best of intentions. And when they send the tape back to Earth with the supposed cure for disease, when they play it, you know, <laughs> I like how nobody had listened to it beforehand before they play it <laughs> yeah. in the open setting of the, the World Conference. The Zillions basically say, oh, we're actually demanding the ultimate surrender of Earth immediately, or you'll mm -hmm. be destroyed by Godzilla, Rodan, and King Ghidorah, who are all under their computer mind control. So... You know, that's the big kind of reveal. The Zillions were evil. Surprise, surprise. And yeah, then we get a long kind of fun scene, if you like Monsters Destroying Cities, of mm -hmm. kind of montage cross-cutting between Godzilla destroying a city, Rodan flying around destroying. We're told, we don't see a lot of King Ghidorah, we're told he's actually in the United States. That's right. Yes. Destroying things there. So that's kind of interesting because usually we're kind of confined to Japan, but here we know that King Ghidorah is somewhere in the US and, you know, running amok, which is interesting and a bit different. Yeah, this is our first real, like, miniature destruction. We've seen miniatures with the mm -hmm. spaceships and everything, but when they're fighting on, or, or when Ghidorah is flying around on the surface of Planet X, it's just. It's yeah, just it's just barren. There's so nothing. yeah. So this, so this is this is a requirement. This scene. Oh yeah, yeah, and it's it's a long, good scene. There's a lot of destruction. So if you're into that sort of thing, this is a good one for that. Definitely appealed to me when I was a little kid, and I thought it still looked great now. And it's the way of having their cake and eating it too, because mm -hmm. Godzilla's finally a hero. Yeah, it's true. But but let's have him destroy cities still. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, because he's under mind control, so you know he's not responsible for his actions. I mean, that's what they do in the opening scene of the Mechagodzilla one, because it's just Godzilla destroying a city, except it's yes. Mechagodzilla hidden behind yeah, yeah. a Godzilla suit. Yeah, I'm always amazed at the details that they put into the miniatures. Mm -hmm. Like, if a wall rips away on, like, a, a house or anything, you can see the little furniture fall out or little papers mm -hmm. blow off the desks. It's just incredible, the detail they put into some of these. There's never convincing that it's not miniatures, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you have to appreciate the craft. Yeah, you know, it, it, there is look, a lot it looks great. It really it. looks great. Yeah. 
So yeah, the, the monsters are running amok, destroying cities, which is, you know, fun for everyone. Glenn storms into Namikawa's office and finds her dressed in her zillion outfit. <laughs> which, if people hadn't already pieced it together, this was the reveal of that. And she admits she's one of the spies, obviously, but that she's also fallen in love with Glenn. Yeah, I, who, I who was supposed why. to marry you based on being a spy, but I've actually grown yes. grown accustomed to your face, to quote yeah. my fair lady. Yeah, yeah, even though he's, you know, very bland. Oh, yeah, he, yeah he's like pudgy, and he looked like yeah. somebody. I, a little John Voight. Mm, yeah, not a that's a, a good thing. No, no, it's not. <laughs> yeah, so... The commander arrives to arrest Glenn, but he executes Namikawa for using emotion and not following the computer's orders. But she slips something into Glenn's pocket. He's taken to a cell where he runs into Tetsuo, the inventor who had been captured earlier for kind of trailing Miss Namikawa. And then looking at the note, they discover that the zillions have an Achilles heel and that it actually mm -hmm. is the sounds produced by Tetsuo's Lady Guard machine. I mentioned to Sir Man earlier, so the Twilight Zone, my favorite television show. Do you, yeah. Have you seen the episode Hocus Pocus and Frisbee? Mm, I don't think so. It's the one about the tall tale teller who gets abducted by aliens, and then, you know, obviously after he escapes, no one believes the story, but right. he, the, how he escapes is he plays the harmonica in a very obnoxious way, and it's the same thing as this, because it's just like a, a sound. <laughs> yeah. It's the same thing. I, I yeah. Just, <laughs> Andy Devine, one of the uh, classic Western character actors, getting a star turn in Hocus Pocus and Frisbee, this why it's own episode that <laughs> I rather enjoy. One of the few comedic highlights of that series. Usually the comedy episodes weren't very good. Yeah, that's true. That's that's fun. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I think it's, you know, it's kind of an easy out. It's like, oh, of course yeah. the other main character had invented the very thing we need. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. he, whips it, he whips it out, turns it on, and the guard of their cell immediately like grabs his ears and hunches over. They pull and the key. And runs to them to convince yeah, runs conveniently to them. place the key in, yeah. in arms. Like. Yeah. So they get the key off of him, open up the, the cell, get out. They take out a few other zillions with the lady guard on their way out. And then they make it back to the world government headquarters, whatever, and report that this sound is what can be used to defeat the zillions. And yeah, then the Japanese army kind of sends out these giant laser trucks that also have a whole bunch of speakers mounted on them, and they start blasting it at the monsters, which mm -hmm. breaks the mind control, and then at the UFOs, and then the UFOs eventually start smoking and wobbling and explode, and the monsters kind of wake up from their senses, have a bit of a battle, all fall into the ocean together. King Ghidorah surfaces and flies away, which kind of always reminded me of King Kong swimming away at the end of King Kong vs. Godzilla. Mm -hmm. And then they just kind of speculate that Godzilla and Rodan are probably still alive and chased off King Ghidorah, but it leaves it with a little bit of a question mark. This is a, this is a very fun fight, but it is pretty short, I feel, yeah, like, it's, as far it's as Godzilla brief. climactic yeah. fights yeah. go. Well, first of all, this movie fully establishes, I think we've seen hints before, but Godzilla is a human, and he prefers punching. Yes. <laughs> it's very, Godzilla is a boxer throughout the Showa series, and it's really funny, but it's maybe more effective here because Ghidorah's necks are flailing all around. I like the moment when Godzilla kind of tackles Ghidorah, <laughs> and then there's the cut to the two um, puppets or whatever as they tumble down the hill, and I guess Rodan's part of them. I didn't think Rodan was in that critter ball, but oh yeah, because that, that's because what they all lands in the, the water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't pay attention to the, that <laughs> when I was watching. I don't. I don't know if you see if you see the Rodan puppet yeah. mixed in there. To <laughs> be honest, yeah, Rodan's always kind of a, a wingman or a sidekick. He's never. Uh, always yeah, I was going to ask you, how do you never, feel never about? <laughs> yeah, how do you feel about Rodan? Because I, they never made a Godzilla versus Rodan movie. Rodan was has never been the primary antagonist, and I think it's because no, Godzilla he did. I mean, he ass. had his he had his own film called he did. Rodan, just like Mothra had her own film. But mm -hmm. I don't remember. I've seen it. I know I've seen it, but I don't remember it being memorable. Def definitely a supporting monster. Yeah. Mothra's a star. Yes. Ghidorah's a star. Mm -hmm. Rodan's a supporting. Yeah, it's kind of uh, like, like you, can't, you can't have Anguirus as a, a star either. Yeah, yeah. Anguirus is you know your the poncho supplemental piece 
to your Don Quixote. Or San Sancho, I believe is his name. I think maybe because of the way the, the, the costume and the puppet are built, he can't, has just kind of a scrunchy little face that can't emote. So maybe well, and that's also, why. As, as Jim pointed out in, the, in Ghidorah the Three-Headed Monster, it looks very fat because he has to be big enough for a human to fit in. Yes, yeah, but then he has got this tiny bird head. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he would he would not be one of my favorite monsters. I always liked stretch. him as a kid because he's just a pterodactyl, basically. But mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, all the other ones have like special abilities, and Rodan just kind of leaves you cold. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> There's no better way to put it. I don't think. <laughs> yeah, and then I guess that you could say this movie kind of establishes the trend of King Ghidorah being like the recurring big bad of yeah. the Godzilla world because. A trend I love, by the way. I, yeah, I, I think yeah. I think that as awesome as Godzilla is, and I still think he works better as villain than hero. Mm -hmm. Talk about like a perfect villain to put against him. Like I, the series truly was comfortable making him much more powerful than Godzilla. Yeah, yeah. He never Godzilla never beats him alone, and it's usually more than just another one other monster. And it's interesting, too, even in the new Legendary pictures, they kind of made King Ghidorah the main villain. Yeah, that's what that's what you do. He's the Blofeld. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So that's kind of interesting. And this movie, I think, establishes that trend, because in the prior movie, he was there, but that was his first movie. This one is the first mm -hmm. one to bring him back, which kind of makes him this recurring threat. Yeah, we haven't gone back to Anguirus yet. Um, yeah. We, we already got rid of Mothra, you know, short term, she'll be back. Yeah, but. yeah, exactly. Yeah, so then the very last thing in the film is Glenn is sent to Planet X to kind of become an Earth ambassador. Yeah, we're still committed to diplomatic ties with them for some reason. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe maybe it was just the bad ones that came to Earth to destroy the planet. <laughs> I like how they name him ambassador. He's just like, oh, that's great. We'll never have to go back there again. Here, actually, that's not true. You're the ambassador. Like, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's how it was in the dub anyway. On the spot, yeah. Yeah. They leave, and then the, the Japanese character, Owari, which just means end, pops up on the screen, uh, which I thought was interesting that they left that in, in the English dub. A lot of the older ones, I know they would cut that and then just paste to the end mm -hmm. on like a, a blue screen or something in the English dubs. But they left mm -hmm. the Japanese kanji in. And yeah, the movie kind of quickly and abruptly ends at that point. Yeah, no um, half-baked moral at the end, as the series was kind of known to do. No, yeah, there's no denouement at all, I would say. You just kind of go from the climax to kind of a concluding joke <laughs> and the movie ends. There's no, uh, there's no wrapping up of anything in this movie. Yeah, the Godzilla movies are famous for just like summing up the theme of the movie in one line or whatever. And yes. like, remember, we need to stop testing with nuclear weapons, or this yeah, could happen yeah. again. Something. We very watch the skies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is very watch the skies. That's true. In this case, maybe it's you know even watch the sea. Yeah, or I, I was gonna say like even make peace with you know these villains you know aim for peace kind of a thing which yeah but it's not compelling. but it's not vocalized anyways no 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 it's not nearly as direct yeah so that is what i used to call godzilla versus monster zero or which i do think is the best title yeah invasion of astro monster or giant monster war <laughs> yeah yeah that was the literal translation right? yes yeah yeah <laughs> yeah that, that's sense, the worst so. one yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, Sean, what did you think of Godzilla vs. Monster Zero? Yeah, it's it's always been one of my favorites. I think I've told you before in one of our prior episodes that of all the ones that I would pick from the, the Showa era to just sit down and watch, it would be Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla. That's always just been I, my favorite. That would favorite probably be mine as well, yeah. For fun watching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one was definitely up there um, when I was a kid in terms of one that I would watch repeatedly. Yeah, it's a good movie. Just one little postscript on Nick Adams. <laughs> oh no. He sadly died three Pretty young. years after this, I think. Yeah, 36 yeah, in, years old in or something like that. 1968 at the age of 36 with what seems to be an accidental drug interaction, I guess we should call it. And I left this out with his connection with Elvis, but it was 
it's more or less accepted that he and Elvis just did a ton of prescription drugs together in the 60s. Yeah, yeah. But from what I could find, he did actually have prescriptions for them, whether they were legit or not. Mm -hmm. But it was an interaction between uncommonly mixed prescription drugs that killed him. And actually, shortly after his death, the FDA issued kind of a warning that they shouldn't be prescribed together. So Interesting. So the FDA has the Godzilla moral at the end. Yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so there had been, you know, questions about suicide, overdose, things like that, but it seems like it was actually just an accidental thing. But Had he no, come back to the U.S.? We'll never, we'll never know for sure. Or is he still in Japan? No, he died in L.A., so... Okay, so he's just over in Japan for a year yeah, or two, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so very sad ending to Nick Adams. Anyways, back to this silly movie in which Nick Adams is actually quite bad in. I agree with you. I like this movie. I would not put it as one of my favorites, but I, I certainly understand it. I think this is as unique a Godzilla film as there's ever been, because a lot of them, one might be a little bit better than the other, but you can lump them into a lot of categories, or, or, or to a few categories, right? You have your like serious Godzilla movies, that's your original. Maybe you put Raids again in there, and then you put some newer ones. Yeah. And then you have your really Before. silly ones, your, yeah. your son of Godzilla your um, Megalon. And then you have the ones that are kind of just, they're a little silly, but they're largely just kind of well done. And I think of like, I would put Ghidorah in there. I would put Mothra vs. Godzilla. I would put a lot of the 90s ones in there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is kind of its own thing because it has, it's as heavy into sci-fi as the series has ever been, which makes it both like more self-serious mm -hmm. in that first act but also, like, it's in, in its own realm of silliness. You do get silliness with the monsters, but you have silliness just kind of in the all throughout the setting and everything. Yeah, the plot's and, a bit silly. The yeah, uh, it's it's not yeah it's it's not treated. It's not like the evil businessman in Mothra vs. Godzilla, which is silly but really really well done. Right, right. Here's a question: between this one and the prior film, which one do you think's better? Not this and the thing, sorry. This and the Ghidorah the Three-Headed Monster. I would say Ghidorah, but it's relatively close. I like the human plot in Ghidorah with the missing princess and mm -hmm. the princess slash Venusian prophetess. Yeah. I think it's silly and weird and largely pretty well done. This one, because the, the worst thing a Godzilla movie can do is not give you enough Godzilla. And this movie, Invasion of Astro Monster, arguably does that. But it still keeps it pretty engaging and entertaining when there's not monsters on screen. I just think Ghidorah, the three-headed monster, does even a better version of that. Yeah, it's true. This one, we do quite, wait quite a while to actually see Halfway through, roughly halfway through is their fight on Planet yeah. X. About 40 minutes in or so. Yeah, because it's, it's only a 93-minute movie. Even though it's, and there's like, only it, two it feels fights. A bit there's longer. a little bit of destruction. There's not as much destruction as there usually is, as I mentioned, no, because... No. The monsters are roaming around on a surface that has no cities. Yeah. It's interesting. It actually kind of reminds me of in the very late Godzilla movies, like Megalon, Gigan. They kind of have a similar thing because their budgets have been cut by that point. And then they're just <laughs> fighting in the Japanese landscape, but all it yeah. has is a couple trees and just brown dirt and a blue <laughs> sky. It, it's kind of funny how we go back from... You know, these elaborate miniatures in half of this movie, but the desolate... And then it just starts looking very Power Rangers. And then it's kind of like we get back to that later, yeah. Because they just couldn't afford to do the elaborate miniatures anymore. But yeah, I agree with you. I think this is a good movie. It's definitely not a great one, I think. Other, other than the original, obviously, from this era, Mothra vs. Godzilla is really the shining star. I think that just tells its story so well. This has a unique story... But we were kind of laughing at a little bit of how the storytelling unfolds. I, yeah. I like that it's something different, but it is very corny. Yes, definitely. I mean, the housewives delegate. Oh well, that yeah. That's I mean, that's like a that's, that's like amazing. a laugh a laugh moment. It which is. I don't think it's what they were going for. No, I, they couldn't have been. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that that had me cracking up. Yeah, that's right. And, and and I had misremembered it. I thought, it, and maybe my dub was different. I thought it was just like the women's delegate, which itself is funny. But if it's specifically yeah, if it's the, the housewives, housewives delegate, yeah. that's even funnier. I yeah. think in my dub, it might have been women. So, Sean, which of these two films do you prefer? 
The Thing from Another World, or Godzilla vs. Monster Zero. You know, this might be the toughest call of all the, the episodes that I've done with you. Yeah, yeah, this is, I, 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 this is a tough one for me, and I've yeah. done a lot more episodes than you. I, I think it would really just depend on what mood I'm in. I think um, you're right. <laughs> I think if, you're right. I, I like them both, and sometimes I want to watch the one, sometimes I want to watch the other one. I mean, neither of them are my go-to movies. Um, oh, even both, of their kind, good. yeah. Yeah, but... I mean, it's, it's, this is really, are you in the mood for a 50s sci-fi or are you in the mood for a 60s sci-fi night? Yeah, that's true. That's true. And I'm generally going to prefer the 50s. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially if you're a, a black and white kind of person. Mm-hmm. You know, the whole aesthetic of the thing is very different from Monster Zero. For sure. And I love how colorful 60s sci-fi can be. This was wasn't that kind of robinson crusoe on mars which isn't that great of a movie but the how no. colorful it is or <laughs> it is yeah. or early star trek like those I, I would say the 50s version is forbidden planet but i think that those visuals are to me are like what 60s oh, sci-fi definitely. i is. think i think it's that early technicolor and eastman color I yes think were the big two yeah and just the way the colors were so saturated in the films of the time gives it kind of this somewhat surreal i don't even know how to describe it it looks just it beautiful looks more just vibrant beautiful yeah, yeah yeah it's like more colorful than real life mm -hmm. which is such a change from black and white um which mm -hmm. is interesting but but yeah i think it would depend what mood i was in yeah i would say i probably very sl very slightly prefer the thing from another world but i think i agree it is largely a mood thing i th maybe i'm just more likely to be in the mood for, for that 50 yeah. sci-fi horror yeah than i am for 60s sci-fi schlock monster yeah. movie not really I guess, horror at i guess all. one thing i'd say is there are less movies like the thing from another world because like we were saying you know it's got a bit of the the classic hollywood universal mm -hmm. monster thing going on it's got standard kind of survival horror sci-fi like a very early kind of alien almost mm-hmm but it's different from those, and it's different from the other The Things in a way. Yeah, kind it, of it, it is truly its own thing. Yeah, sure. whereas, you know, Monster Zero, there's a lot of other Godzilla movies. and But they are of, different than this, though. They are, they are, they are. But if you're in the mood for a Godzilla movie, you have more choices, I guess, is what I would say. And you have better choices. Yeah, know, yeah, definitely. Worth definitely. With The Thing from another world, there's, you know, nothing totally like it. And so, uh, what do you think of this as a double feature? I think we were kind of getting to that already. Well, we we found, I don't quite remember what they were in our prior episodes. I remember, I think both times, or at least two of the times. Religious we, fanaticism we, in Planet yeah. of the Apes and Giant Spider Invasion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was unexpected connections. Prison the, escape in Godzilla Raids again, and that's right. killing American style. That's right, yes, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. convicts. The unexpected minor subplot connections. This one, I don't know if it has. I guess maybe the the unnatural blonde hair of Doctor. <laughs> yeah, there there aren't a Tarrington lot of like and, details. Um, and Nick Adams, they both kind of have that creepy bleach blonde <laughs> actor look. <laughs> yeah. uh, and obviously, they're both alien invasion movies. Yeah, I think there's the the connections are more broad and general. Yeah. But these films also, I think, easier, more easily fit into each other than the other double features. Yeah, we don't have to done. stretch to turn these into a double exactly. feature. I think they would they would definitely make sense naturally as a double feature. But mm -hmm. yeah, the, the weird blonde <laughs> character. Subjugation of women, the Housewives yeah. Committee, <laughs> and right. kind of the way right. they, uh, eh, they, don't, they don't do it too bad with with, uh, was, what was her name, Nikki? I just remember, I, like, I think they might be doing a a women know cooking yes, thing and that's yeah. how we ultimately yeah. learned to I mean, she vegetable. probably is depicted better in the thing than most 1950s i think films. so so i think so even though it's flawed by our standards uh, it's pretty progressive almost for the time oh yeah yeah, yeah. It, it maybe not progressive it's just not an issue it's just i'm, yeah, I'm stretching yeah, yeah, it to make so, it a, an so. issue but i mean the fact that they make her actually like a character that has some initiative of her own and actually solves some problems is is pretty good 
Yeah, and uh, yeah, I think this is a pretty great double feature. I think you get 50 sci-fi, 60 sci-fi. You get different versions of monsters, like a more a sillier version in Godzilla and like a more serious one, but still kind of silly because it's dated yeah. with the thing. Yeah, good fire effects in both movies. That's true. Yeah, I really liked the, the amount of smoke we see popping off of the Godzilla suit when uh, Ghidorah's yes. zapping him because yeah, you, yeah. you know that they, actor's in danger. It. They cinched it this time. Oh, did they? Okay. Oh, well, so. I, it looks like they did. I mean, the Godzilla okay. suit changes several times. Yeah, uh, which is the one that he's, he, that it actually gets set on fire in? Is that is that Mothra? I think it's Mechagodzilla. Mechagodzilla, yeah. okay. That probably is the most pyrotechnics of all the Godzilla movies. You're oh, probably, probably. Right. yeah, yeah. Well, just when Mechagodzilla is standing there firing all his multiple weapons, exactly. the whole screen is just kind of filled with smoke and like, uh, <laughs> that's, little that's, rockets going that, that movie truly is amazing. <laughs> you, is. You are, that is the most entertaining of the Godzilla movies, it is, I think, it of, is. of the old ones. <laughs> it's just fun. Yeah. And it's got like the most Japanese businessman-esque a- alien captain, I guess you could say, that's running their, their base. That's right. Who in the previous film I think were gorilla people, right? And they're not gorilla people in Mexico. They are, but only when they, they are, get they injured. Are, when they get injured, they're, 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 they're gorilla back people. To but gorillas, it, yeah. but in the sequel, in the next Mechagodzilla movie, they're not gorilla people anymore, which is a shame. It's a damn shame. <laughs> yes. You can't introduce gorilla people and then get rid of them. Then take them away. No. Yeah. That's true. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah. Anyways, Invasion of the Astro Monster does not have gorilla people no but it has a more fine, typical more typical aliens i guess you but say. is a fine follow-up to the thing from another world which doesn't have gorilla people it has vegetable people and it's a lot less silly than it sounds yeah a good double feature overall for sure for sure so thank you sean for joining me thank you for having me it's been I wish great you luck to be back or enjoyment or whatever at that virtual godzilla conference you're going to you're <laughs> yes. attending yeah but yeah next time we're actually doing another japanese movie next time me and jim and i'm curious sean if you know anything about this no monsters but it's a movie called sonatine from 1993 it is written or i don't know about written it is directed by and starring takeshi katano of both takeshi's castle which i know nothing about but jim is a fan of and battle royales fame so I've yes. seen it on 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 lists of like best Yakuza movies. So I don't know much about it, but I think it's a respected film. I'm pretty sure I actually saw that in grad school in a Japanese film class. So okay. he's he's popularly known by the name Beat Takeshi. Beat, yeah. Is Sonatine the one he? Yes. Okay. Yes, I've seen that movie. Okay. Is he, it good? He, yeah. He directs, writes, and edits it. Beat Takeshi. Okay. From what I remember, it's like ultra violent. Violent. Yeah, a lot of yakuza. And movies. kind of, kind of experimental. But I think it'll be a good one for you. Yeah. Well, let's let's see what it's paired with because it's paired with the 1982 film Splits with a Z. I think it's a sex comedy about cheerleaders. I, I know nothing about this film. It's gonna be a weird double feature, I think. Uh, one artistically ambitious film and one. <laughs> cheap 80s teen sex comedy but yeah uh, so, so, so join us next time Jim will be back, we'll be talking a Japanese Yakuza classic and the 1982 film Splits